everything I've worked for is now gone. Mm -hmm. What is, what is the next thing? And trying to get through that, you're not going to, there is no, hey, here's the magic bullet to make that happen or get through that. It was a it's really self-reflection of who is Nick outside of baseball. Because mm. there was no identity that I had other than, hey, I, I hit the ball hard and we can go party on weekends. That was, that was really it. Welcome to Connecting the Dots. I'm your host, Jessica Carice, and this space is a place where we talk about seemingly random topics, but not actuality. They're all connected together. And today we have Nick Mershon. <laughs> he is an entrepreneur. He was in the Navy. He's, I don't know, I guess you could say a modern day Renaissance man. Ooh, I, I like that. <laughs> that. That's a first. That's a first in an intro. <laughs> So we met back in August at the vault. Absolutely. And it's interesting because, you know, there was lots of different things that took place uh, during that conference, but we were supposed to be building out a consulting firm together. Yeah. Biggest, biggest, cons biggest consulting firm in the world and take on other people that are in the consulting industry. <laughs> and it was, it was a fun, it was a fun, fun message and a great message but the pieces of hey let's actually put this together and because my i asked straight up i said hey when we when this was said we've both worked at consulting firms i said is that the type of consulting firm we're building out and i was told by somebody over there that no and not any time in the next three to six months i said okay cool mm -hmm. that, that's that's all i needed to know because once you see the framework, once you see, hey, here's how you can help businesses business better. I don't, I don't need the label to go do it. I just need the connections and the handshakes to go make it happen and help that business. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was, it was a good conversation. Uh, Jessica was over there on, on the left hand side and stood up and said, "I used to work at a place." And, he's, and Pat was like, "Hey, I want to talk to you later." I was like, "Okay, cool." <laughs> so, um, but great conversation and. Great background of hey, here's here's what I've done, here's who I've helped, and obviously me being at me being there for a year while I was in the consulting world, there was a connection there, and we ran with it. So mm -hmm. it's been fun. Yes, yes, and now here we are. We're both doing our own thing. Oh yeah, you know it's been you know even though that side of the house didn't pan out, I'm very happy because. It's given me a chance to develop myself and yeah. develop my own future, define what I want to do, how I want to go about it, build my own reputation. Yeah. And it's allowed for you to do the same thing. For sure. And sure. so what I want to do, I want to jump into your background. Yeah. I want to know everything about Nick Marchand. You have eight kids on top of it. Eight kids, <laughs> eight, eight, eight lovely children. It's chaos. But I was, I'm the oldest of seven. So being around kids has been my whole life. My great grandmother died at 100 right before her 104th birthday. She had five kids. My grandmother had five kids. Wow. Each of my grandmother's five children, so all my aunts and uncles minus one of them have four or more. Wow. So family reunions were chaos. I was always around kids anyway. And growing up, we grew up outside of Chicago and then lived in South Carolina for all my formative years. But it was baseball was the ticket. Dad played ball with the Reds for a year. I've always been around kids. It's always been fun to help at, in whatever capacity. But without without the baseball background, I never go to college. I don't do any of the things that I had the opportunity to do because I could hit the baseball really far. So hmm. thank you, Dad, for countless hours in the cage, on the field, everywhere else, and all of the the missed vacations and whatever else happened was great because it set me up for getting school paid for mm -hmm. and three different, I went to three different colleges in three different years because class was overrated. And my, <laughs> for those of you that don't understand baseball, your batting average and your slugging percentage are a number that starts with a point something. And my GPA in my last year of brick and mortar college was less than my batting average. Oh my God. So it was, it was rough, <laughs> right? It was four D's and an F. If you're looking for ideal student, it, it was not me at the time. And I didn't figure out until really 2012, 2013, three, four years into the Navy, four or five years into the Navy to figure out, Hey, I should go back to school. They're going to pay for it anyway and finish this degree out and figure out what's next. So hmm. that's, 
the baseball background, a little bit of the Navy background, but without, without baseball, I don't, I've had so many different things happen because I could hit a ball and opportunities there. So my best one, best story I have there was I was done my junior, my sophomore year of college, Mm -hmm. got kicked off of the, got kicked off of the junior college baseball team because I wasn't eligible. Right. They lost 12 or 13 games. Right. Coach was not happy, Oh wow! obviously. And my, my grandpa passed that summer. Mm. So we're down in Tampa. We're on the way back. And dad's like, Hey, there's this tryout over in Lakeland. I was like, cool, dad. I don't have any of my stuff. He's like, all your stuff's in the trunk. (laughs) Of course it is. Of course it is. Dad. Of course you already prepared for this. And I show up to the tryout. I'm signing in and the scout that recruited me in South Carolina is the one that's running the event. He's like, Hey Nick, why don't you plan anywhere? It's like, I don't really enjoy school. So I'm, I'm not, he's like, okay, okay, cool. Let's see, let's see what you have and we'll see if I have a spot for you. And baseball tryout, you run, you throw. And if you do well enough, you get to hit. Mm-hmm. They had an inner squad. So ran decent through. Okay. And got to hit. I'm sitting there one, two, I take a pitch that's borderline. I look at the catcher because we don't have an umpire. The catcher's like, no, you're good. It's okay. Cool, man. I hit the next ball 400 feet to left center field out of the park, trot around the bases, get done with that. And in that moment, it was like, hey, my grandpa's here with me on this field because mm-hmm. that, that allowed me to go to Florida Southern, play the Tiger, play the actual Detroit Tigers, go one for three with a double, and really live out my childhood dream of play on a major league baseball field and make it all happen. Hmm. But all that happened because dad said, Hey, you're going to go to this thing mm-hmm. and we're going to push forward. And so thank you. Thank you, dad. Thank you, grandpa for all the opportunities that I've had. That's so nice. Yeah. So like, was your dream as a kid to just be a professional baseball player? Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. There was no, there was no second option i never said hey i'm gonna go be an astronaut there was no i was a baseball player i was born in august i was a baseball player for my first halloween at when i was two months old Mm -hmm. so it was always a thing dad played ball with the reds for a year and it was just his ticket Mm -hmm. right and we had we had some money growing up but it was not all over everywhere so my my way into college was, hey, I have to play ball and make all the rest of this happen. So mm-hmm. it was, was good. Was it the same for the rest of your siblings as well? Did they all want to do baseball? Yeah. So all of my all my little brothers are playing right now. I've got a brother at Ohio State, that's the second baseman. I've got a brother at Mississippi State, that's the second baseman, a shortstop, and then next brother down just committed to Carolina. He doesn't graduate until twenty five. Mm-hmm. But we've we've got shirts that say Mershons are good at baseball that we like hand out to people. So mm. <laughs> it's it's real, it's fun, and it the discipline there is what helped me with everything else that I've done in life. Because it was, mm-hmm. hey, we're gonna show up, we're gonna look the part, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z, and we're gonna put the work in. Yeah. For whatever the opportunity or the outcome is. Yeah, yeah. Is it warm in here? I'm hot. I am. I don't know how. I'm sweating. <laughs> I've also been talking for four <laughs> hours straight, so yes. I don't know how that camera is like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I got really hot real fast. Thank you for bearing wow. with us. Um, so from baseball to the Navy. So yeah. what, what, how did you even think about, okay, like I'm done with baseball for now. I'm going to go into the Navy. Oh no, I got hurt. I got hurt. So um, I was, we were playing later in the season at Southern dove for a ball and left. And I tore, I tore my right labrum, my freshman year, like mm-hmm. the summer of my freshman year, right before I started at Furman. So I knew, I knew what a torn labrum felt like. I made it back for almost the whole season at Furman and show like had a, a pretty decent season, but mm-hmm. I laid out, I was playing right field, dove for a ball in the gap, left arm hurt. Okay, cool. No, no issues. And then hit a hit a double later in the game, slid head first into second, and it would it wouldn't go past here, right? So I, I couldn't lift it past my shoulder. Yeah, I was supposed to start the next day, but I was going to sleep that night, saying, "Pretty sure I tore my labrum again." Oh, so no. I'm supposed to start the next day. I'm out in right field trying to catch a ball with alligator arms, essentially, because I can't lift it. And I'm in the starting lineup, and I go up to coach and I said, "Hey, Pete, I can't 
I can't go today. He's like, what do you mean you can't go today? I was like, I tore my labrum. He said, how do you, how do you know you tore your labrum? You haven't done any. I said, I've torn the right one. I know exactly what this feels like. He said, okay, what can you do? I said, I can pinch hit if you need me to. So hit my, my last at bat in college was a sacrifice fly for us to go ahead and phenomenal best, best story ever. Cause our third, our third base coach at the time looked at me cause it was, this was eighth or ninth inning. And before the at bat, he's like, Mershon, I don't need you to hit the ball 900 feet. Right. We just need you to hit a fly ball and make this happen. And guy threw a first pitch curveball and I swung out of my shoe. Because I knew this is my last at bat. <laughs> guy threw a curveball in the dirt. I missed it by four feet, five feet. And I saw, I can still see Logan to this day, throw his hands up, scream, turn around, and start walking down the left field line, just upset. And oh. I hit the next pitch to, to right field and we scored, won the game. Or guy from third scored, won the game. But it was fun seeing just that whole dynamic of, Hey, this is awful. But going into that at bat, I was like, this is my last, this is my last at bat in college. And so tore, tore up the shoulder, couldn't play anymore. Wasn't going to go do the rehab for it. Cause it was hmm. six or eight hours a day hmm. to, to get this back. But hung out in Lakeland for a year and a half, two years, mm -hmm. bartended, waited tables. That was good. It was good money. And then kid one was on the way and mm -hmm. I need a career. Mm -hmm. I, bartending and waiting tables is awesome and phenomenal money, but there's no, I don't have any benefits. I don't have anything moving forward. So joined the Navy March of 08 and thought I was going to get away from school. My first two years in the Navy were all training and schooling mm. before I got to the boat. So it was, it was fun. It was different, but that was, Hey, I need something else to go do. There's this nuclear submarine program. I'm going to go be a part of it. And the track record of Nick being amazing at school, my first 11 months in the Navy, they said, hey, he, hey we don't want you to be a nuke anymore because I failed out of power school. Got through, <laughs> got through A school. But I think I went four for 14 on tests in power school. So failed 10 of them before they finally said, hey, you can, you can go to this next thing. But that was, that was my journey from baseball into, into the Navy. So, like... Walk me through your mindset at that time, right? Yeah. Because you emphasize how much baseball was your dream. Yeah. Baseball was your dream. For sure. And then, you know, you have your last sacrifice hit. Yeah. You're torn up. How are you really feeling? Though? Oh, terrible. Terrible. I didn't. I looked at myself in the mirror because I was probably two, 220, 225 when I played. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do. I didn't do anything for probably three months, four months. I was the couch guy. I was sitting in bed. I was hanging and looked at myself at a terrible, terrible looking 250, 255 in the mirror one day and went and ran, went out and ran five miles. Mm. Cause I, I was like, Hey, I don't, I don't know what's next, but it's not sit around and feel sorry for myself. Mm. I gotta go figure out what it was. Got the, the bartending and waiting tables job two or three days later. Mm -hmm. And then figured out, Hey, what, what do I have to do? That's next. But that was, that was a low point. That wasn't the lowest point, but that was a big low point where everything I've worked for is now gone. Mm -hmm. What is, what is the next thing? And trying to get through that, you're not going to, there is no, Hey, here's the magic bullet to make that happen or get through that. It was a it's really self-reflection of who is Nick outside of baseball. Mm -hmm. Cause there was no identity that I had other than, Hey, I hit the ball hard and we can go party on the weekends. That was, that was really it. Yeah. So did you have like your family support trying to, you know, yeah. Talk? Oh yeah. I moved, mm -hmm. I moved back in with mom and dad at 21, 22 for, I don't know, two or three months before that, that was not going to work and ended up back down here in Florida, but f family support's always been there. I had, I had a couple uncles actually offer me money to not join the Navy. Oh, wow. So they're like, hey, Nick, we'll give you X amount of dollars to not join. I said, that's cool. Th this amount of money is great, but what do I, then what? Mm -hmm. Right? Because you're going to give me X amount of dollars. That's fun. And that lasts me three months, six months, a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then what? I don't have a career. I'm not learning any skills while I'm doing this. I'm still doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have this family at some point that I have to provide for. What, what am I actually going to do? So... Great conversations, but I, I walked out of the Air Force recruiting station because they said, hey, you can't see really well. And took all my stuff and said, okay, cool. What's up, Navy? What can I do for you? 
and they said, well, we've got these two or three programs and you tested pretty well, so let's go. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yeah. then, so then you also mentioned you had baby number one on the way. Yeah. So when did you meet your, 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 I met Madeline at Fridays in Greenville, South Carolina. So when everybody asks, Hey, what was that insignificant event that changed your life completely? I was back home for a few months. I went and applied at Chili's and Fridays. And I got the job at Fridays and I saw her there day one or two. Mm. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. And that was, we were together for two years, three years before we got married. Had Matt, Matthew was two or three when we got married. So mm. we had him 07, got married December of 08. Mm-hmm. And we've had seven amazing children since then. So, wow. but yeah, that's the, the the insignificant thing where if we're doing the connect the dots thing, if I don't ever get hurt, I don't apply to either of those jobs and I'm not where I'm at today. Mm-hmm. So when people ask, what is what would you change or what do you regret? The answer is absolutely nothing because I'm right here today. So. Yeah. 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 That's really nice. Yeah. So now. We have that big chunk of, of significant self-reflection, yeah. transformation. That's like phase one, right? For sure. For and sure. now you're in the Navy. Yeah. What were you doing in the Navy? So I thought I was going to be a shimmer. So I thought I was going to play with, with the, rea- the reactor and be in the engine room. That was a, an 11-month endeavor where I made rank because I got through school one. Mm-hmm. Did not get through school two. So they sat me down and they said... Hey, you said you want to be a submariner. You have to go to sub school up in Connecticut. Do you want to shoot missiles or play with sound or help people not hit stuff and shoot torpedoes? And I said, well, we're obviously going to go shoot torpedoes because I don't like charts. And I don't <laughs> like just like listening to things. So joined March of 08, left to go to Groton January of 09, was in Groton for a year and then got put on med hold because I messed up my foot playing basketball for a little bit. Mm. So joined joined March of 08, got through sub school, didn't get to the Georgia until May of 2010. Okay. So I was almost, I was over two years before I finally get to the boat and amazing, amazing crew of the USS Georgia blue. And as I sat there, it was, Hey, I'm going to make rank. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. But the longer I was there, I, would, I just extended. So I stayed there till the end of my contract. And you show up, you have a, a mentor from day one, you know who your division is, you have a whole training plan from the first day you step on to whenever you leave. Okay. So that's where everything, because I, I, I did that playing ball already anyway yeah it was just different things so going to the navy it was hey here's here's the system here's how we process things go and there was a procedure for everything on the boat so Mm. when people talk about systems processes and people in the business world i lived that for almost nine years so so you were just so you had your training for two years and then you're on the submarine right underwater underwater how, how big can you like describe the submarine so I can get like a visual? Yeah, so the, I'm gonna be wrong with my number here, but it's 500 and some odd feet. Okay. Right? So, and we were on a, there are three different types of submarines there are BNs, GNs, and SSNs. So small, small submarines, big submarines with big missiles, and big submarines with little missiles. We were a big submarine with little missiles. So we had okay. we had a bunch of a bunch more room than the, the small guys did, but you are four levels. You have four levels, and three different compartments per in each level. So three three compartments, four levels per compartment. Okay. And you, the majority of everybody lives in the middle middle compartment, third level. How like what was the distance from like ceiling to floor? Oh, it depend. It would depend on where you were. Uh huh. So, my I was, I've been on board for three months. We're putting a load line together for a torpedo load. So we've got this giant steel beam that I helped install in the middle of a passageway. Mm-hmm. We leave some of some meeting on cruise mess, and I'm walking to give somebody their hard hat, and just walking normally, and I smoke this thing. 
pass out, blood everywhere, stitches, like the whole nine, right? So I, I am just walking normal. I'm walking at my normal pace, which is fast. I don't, I don't think this thing's here. And I, I helped install it earlier that day, <laughs> right? So rack my head on it. I, I remember it to this day because there were two guys talking in, in the P-Way right there. And I hit and I felt the blood going and I, I like tried to say something and I was out. I woke up with, uh, I think it was our chief of the boat at the time with like a chem wipe on my head just holding me. They're like, hey, are you okay? Oh, so wow. you learn real quick where you can go, where you can't go. There are, being 6'3", there were a couple places where I could stand that were normal. But we had we had a, a guy that was 6'6 six, six mm-hmm. on board and a guy that was 6'10 on board. <gasps> <laughs> so and they would go to they would go to the the ladder wells the stairways and stand there for 15 minutes 20 minutes at a time because there was nowhere else where they could go that oh it's not God. hunched over so for for me it, it wasn't real bad like mm-hmm. you find out real quick hey where can you walk where can't you walk it was worse when a little guy racked himself or hit something mm-hmm. because they're used to cruising around at a normal level mm-hmm. and when they when they would hit themselves we had a guy that hit him rocked him, almost knocked himself out and had had a couple stitches too but when they did it, you were like, "Ooh, that was bad." Oh. So you learn you learn real quick where you can walk, where you can't walk. But you also learn real quick. Hey, are these 125 of my best friends or 125 of my worst enemies? Yeah. Because there's no, you can't go anywhere. Yeah. You're there. You're you're going to sleep at work. You're waking up at work. There's noise. There's alarms. There's stuff happening every step of the way, and. It was fun from a, just a system standpoint because mm-hmm. we ran eighteen hour days, six hours six hours at a time on watch and then off watch and then sleep, mm-hmm. rinse repeat for the first five and a half years I was down there. So with so yeah, that, I think that was my my assumption about living on a submarine is that it's just tight, cramped. You have all these people. I didn't think it was one hundred and twenty five because in the movies, like <laughs> that the submarines is like only a couple people on there yeah. or something like that. Right. Yeah. One hundred twenty five is a lot. A lot of people. Um, so how long would you be down there at a time? Like when would you be able yeah. to see the sky again? <laughs> For sure. So we we would project the periscope everywhere. So depending on which one we had up, we could see we could see outside. <laughs> Right. But we were we thought our we had a deployment where we left in August. They told us we were going to be back before Thanksgiving. No, they told us we we're going to be back for Halloween, which okay. we, we knew we weren't going to be back for Halloween. We're like, OK, cool. But Captain came on board, came on the the mic a month and a half in two months in. And he's like, hey, guys, we're doing some great stuff out here and we're going to stay out here. Oh my god! Until they tell us to stop, <gasps> right? So we're so like, there's no. We're end like, date. okay, no, th- there, there was no, there was no end date. But he also said, usually you would have your your deployment. You would come back. You would do a workup for something, and there was an inspection period, whether it was the engine room or the forward the forward part of the boat, that you had to you had to do a bunch of drills and run a bunch of stuff. He said, we're not going to have any inspection. We're not going to have anything at the end of this. We're just going to go on watch. We're going to do the work here. We're going to clean a little bit. And then we're going to go back home. And we're like, okay, cool. Like, mm-hmm. we're, we're here. And we thought that was going to be our longest one. Right? So, and we had different watch sections. We call that the Chubb deployment because we were, our watch section was the, the USS Chubb. It's SSN 329. And still still to this day, you have people running around like throwing a C up and screaming this. <laughs> because we thought that was going to be the longest one. That was 115, 120 days. Oof. Our next one was 135. Oh. So so we thought that was going to be the long one, but the once once you're down there, it's you don't have a crazy pressure change mm. like you do with your ears on a on a plane, mm. mm-hmm. right? So you're going to hear the hull like shrink and and pop and come back, but you, there was no no effect on us inside the people tank part of it. Yeah. So that was and you're you're there, you're working, and you find out real quick like hey, who's who's the smelly guy. Who needs the hot sauce or who do you not talk to until they have their third cup of coffee, depending on what's going down? How do you not lose your mind? Oh, they, they run you through a whole bunch of psych tests before you go down there. Like that was the first the first thing they do at sub school is like, hey, here's your test. And we're like, when, when we transferred up from nuke school to sub school, there were. I'm going to say 12 of us that all went up together and then we took that test. And we looked at each other and we're like, how many of us are gonna get gonna get to go talk to health? 
<laughs> right? So they, they had a shrink on site, and they're like, hey, guys, we had four guys we had four guys get disqualified from submarines on the spot and then six six of us had to go talk to this this shrink about however however our test results came out but we had one of our one of our, our best one one of our buddies walked in and the the psychiatrist looked at him and he said you're not going on submarines <laughs> <laughs> And, and and he didn't he didn't know great dude still love him to this day but he he just looked at like he was fighting for like no hey here's what I've done here's X Y and Z and and she was like absolutely not here's why we're gonna redesignate you to one of these two or three other things but we it, for us it was a running joke we never had we never had anybody lose their minds we had a, a small incident where we had to put. Uh, somebody with a guy for probably 20 days mm -hmm. as, as we were finishing up a deployment. But we never had any huge issues of people losing it mm. once once we were out there. Yeah. Th they also don't, they don't usually bring new person on, brand new, middle of a deployment or right before a deployment. So okay. before you're out there, you've been in a trainer long enough, you've been with your people okay. long enough, you've done a bunch of workups to say, hey, what is this actually like? And sure, you're not down there usually, but you're in a trainer somewhere doing something yeah. to where, hey, okay, this is this is my everyday life. But it was like, what is your outlet, right? So you're, so you're gonna work out, you're gonna play cards, you're gonna read, you're gonna play video games. If you don't have oh. your degree finished, you're gonna you're gonna finish up your degree. That's but nice. my my dad got to come down for. 18 hours for a tiger cruise. Oh, nice. So we take him out, we go down, we do everything else, and he's sitting there in line before we're going to go get dinner. And it's steak and shrimp night. I'm like, Dad, don't get the steak. And he, he doesn't listen, of course. As he gets the steak, he's like, that was awful. I was like, Dad. <laughs> in the middle Dad, of I, Dad I've eaten this a few times. Uh, the, the steak's okay, but when you think steak, this is not your steak, Dad. This is, hey, th this gets the job done. <laughs> and we're sitting there in upper level afterwards, and he's just looking at me, he's like, what do you do? <laughs> He's been on board for four hours, five hours. Right? He's yeah. like, what do you do? Yeah. It's like, Dad, we work out. We play cards. If you haven't finished school, a bunch of guys bring school underway because the Navy's going to pay for it. And you qualify the next section or you sleep. And it, it was his epiphany moment because he looked at me and he's like, I'm really glad you do this. And I don't. I was like... So does the world thinks that too, Dad, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It was just fun seeing him down there because he was the majority of the people on the boat had a family member somebody else that had been in mm -hmm. so they knew what to expect mm -hmm. for him he had he had no idea and it's fun hearing it's fun hearing madeline tell that story of dad just on the car ride back because dad usually doesn't swear but obviously being around it for 20 hours straight cussing like a sailor for a little bit before he turned it back off but it was <laughs> fun fun to be around and just fun for him to see Hey, this is this is what your day to day life is. But the lose your mind portion of it, like you just cope, you just cope, and you knew you could tell real quick if something changed, right? So we'd get mm. emails. There was no, we don't have internet, mm -hmm. right? So if we came up, we'd get emails once a week. Sometimes we'd have email consistently, but usually it was once a week, and you could tell real quick. Hey, did somebody get terrible news? Because you're on watch with them or you're eating with them and j the energy shift changed oh, okay. and you're like, hey, Jessica, what happened? What, what is what is going on? But that's where the the people side of it, mm -hmm. all of your relationships were sped up because yeah. I'm back with you on watch six hours from now. So if we've got beef or we've got things going on, we got to figure that out and shelve it. And hey, here's the mission. Here's what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. Go. Mm. But that was the really the interpersonal relationships, working with difficult people, seeing how different captains run the boat. Because mm -hmm. I was on the same boat the whole time, four different captains. But it was fun just seeing, hey, what's important? What's not important to this one? Okay, cool. And then are you a yeller? Are you a sit back guy? Mm -hmm. right, we, had, we had a guy who was a yeller, but it was when it was important. Mm -hmm. Right. And it made sense. And then coking and joking the rest of the time. We had a captain who was consistency is perfect. And I don't want us to make too much noise. And here's where we're at. This is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then our 
we won back to back to back best boat in the squadron hmm. for three years in a row. Had a new captain come on who spoke amazingly, rode amazingly, didn't know how to operate the boat. We ran aground 87 days later. And it was the happiest I'd ever seen the, the crew in that 87, 88 day window. Hmm. Lunch was like, you should have been silent. Oh, no. Hey, we messed up. This is awful. But for us, it was the safest way for him to no longer be our captain without us. You don't say mutiny on a submarine. That's not a thing you say. But yeah. Without us saying, hey, this is awful. Yeah. yeah. But it's fun seeing great leaders, terrible leaders. And I've got a bunch of stuff in the don't do this toolbox. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you've seen, hey, how do we treat people? How do you make the system work? And how do yeah. you make whatever the mission is for your business or your boat make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So what was your, you know, like when you're in a group. Yeah. And people just start automatically getting roles from the other group. Yeah. So what was your yep. role in the group? So the it changed probably three times on mm -hmm. board. So I got there as a fire control technician, left as a fire control technician. But it, we had two different divisions. So we had a division that helped drive the boat mm -hmm. and where are we positioning ourselves. And then we had a group that shot the, the little missiles for our strike side of things. So my first year on board... I was helping drive the boat, put it in the right place. We had an IT. They they made up a, a rate. They said, hey, we're going to bring this IT rate down. I did that for maybe half of a deployment mm -hmm. before they said, hey, there's no training for this. You're going to learn the manual. I said, this is awful. <laughs> and so I came back and said, hey, I want to be a strike guy because they were shooting all the missiles. They had a little more say in how they operated. Mm-hmm. Versus, hey, this is this is the hard and fast. So we still had a bunch of rules, but that was my last four years on board and then went to dive school in 2012. Mm -hmm. So got through that, dove for the last four years on board. And in my last two years, I was a career counselor helping people get out. Oh. So the, the main job as a fire control technician was awesome yep. and is the day to day, but there's nothing marketable unless I'm going to Raytheon or any of the rest of the big ones. So, yes. OK. I really um, can't just. What was the, no, so the, the marketable skills were what I learned in dive school and the career counseling Yeah. and just the, the people skills. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's like, so, so you were in the Navy from what well, you started your training in 2008 and you yep. were there for eight years. So Not... March of 08 to December of 16. 16. Yep. Wow. So, so you were a career counselor your last two years. Mm hmm what made you decide to transition out of the Navy? You were there for was, a while. I was there for a while. That next enlistment would have been to 14 years. Mm. So coming up on nine, hey, if I re-enlist, this is going to be to 14. If I'm going to 14, we're going to 20. Yeah. Right? So, and we had three, I don't know if we had three or four kids at the time. Mm -hmm. we, we had a, a smaller number, right? But we had hit every wicket we had minus completely out of debt. I got the degree. We got, we got everything else going. And I said, okay, well, hey, let's let's see what else is out there. Mm -hmm. And let's jump into the, the, the manufacturing world. But that transition, even as a career counselor helping other people out, I was unemployed for almost two months. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So back, moved, not didn't move back home with mom and dad, but we were in Georgia for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Went home to South Carolina just to see, hey, from a network standpoint, who do I know? What else can I do? And ended up in Ohio in the manufacturing world for two years. Uh, shout out to Damon Grimes at Lucas Group. Thank you for that role. But I had three different three different recruiters working for me, and they all knew it. I said, hey, you're not the only one working for me. I need something. Here, yeah. Here's what I can do. And that was really where I took the, the networking from college where I'm just going to meet everybody and shake all the hands to, mm -hmm. hey, how can I translate this to business and make it happen? But I was up front with everybody saying, hey, hey, Jordy, hey, Mike, you, you guys aren't the only two working for me. Here's what else I'm doing. If it pops, awesome. If it doesn't, cool. But I had two offers, two offers within a 24 hour period that I'd make a decision on. Mm -hmm. So it was it was cool. It was trying. Yeah. Right. Because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm out of the Navy. 
this is the, this is the real world the real world yeah right and all I know is hey here's the amount I made in the Navy I need to make at least that on the outside to make it happen but we moved to Ohio for two years and shut down a plant opened a plant it was in the medical device neck and neck and back manufacturing world for two years okay leading some great people up in Ohio but shut down a plant opened a plant and that's where the process improvement the get it done the structure of mm -hmm. the Navy I translated that into the the manufacturing world and had zero clue about manufacturing at the time I was a people leader right but they're like hey you're gonna you, you can learn the manufacturing side we need help with this this shift can you come on and make it happen I said, yeah let's go so mm -hmm. my first 30 days there I was just solving people problems learning more about what they did day to day mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then helping helping the team wherever I could so would you say that from the time you start uh, joining the Navy up until even with the manufacturing, you always had a can-do attitude? Or was it like, yeah. did you ever feel indecisive? Like, oh, am I doing the right thing? Or like, what was your driving, motivating factor? For sure. So on the submarine, you don't say that's not my job ever, especially as a, a super junior guy. There are a couple different, there's a couple different spots where you can say something, you can have a conversation saying, hey, this is this is a role or this is a thing that we're going to bring some other people on or I'm going to help with another division on fine. Mm -hmm. But the the get it done, you didn't have an option. Right? We had arguably on the strike side, we worked hard every 18 months for a month straight. Right. Mm -hmm. So missile testing. 24 hour days is not the right amount of time because it was 36. Sometimes it Oof. was 30 sometimes where you're. Hey, we've got 15 minutes. I'm going to go nap in the lounge. Wake mm. me up whenever we need to come back. So when there was stuff to do, you were there until it was done and mm -hmm. you're making it happen. But taking that to a manufacturing plant that's open 24 hours. Cool. Mm -hmm. Let's go. I'm going to go meet a couple people on the other shift, especially there early. Had some great leaders that were amazing. And then as we, as we were turning the new plant around, getting everything done, they came in and canned almost all of leadership in, oh, wow. in like a in like a weekend. Oh wow. So we had we had quarter results come out. We're doing great. And we showed up that Tuesday and we had three people gone. Wow. And we we're like, what happened? What is so and then had a few people trickle out after that just to go a couple other places. Uh -huh. But it was it was a weird timing thing especially in the corporate world where, hey, we had a great quarter, but we're getting rid of the people that got you there. Mm -hmm. What year that. was this? This was 17, 18. 18, okay. 18, so this was early 18. Yeah. Where it's like, hey, what? We, we finally turned the corner, new plants up and running, gone. New CEO came in, and they're still doing great, but it was weird from a timing standpoint because there was no... Have safety issues. We we're profitable. Yeah, things were rolling. It was and the economy a, a, a was good time. too. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but that learned learned a bunch. Got my did a bunch of Six Sigma training there. Got into they they had an outside consultant come in that was a systems processes guy. Mm -hmm. So sat went to a couple of their trainings and then was I went from second shift to weekend night shift guy. Okay. Because I can I can work four days and you're gonna pay me the same. Cool. I can spend more time with kids during the week and make it all happen. But Grant was yelling at me. Grant Cardone was yelling at me on a YouTube video at <laughs> three in the morning there in uh, early 2019. He's like, hey, if you're a veteran, you should come to Growth Con in Miami for 2019 and make all. And here's we're going to, you know, 10x your life. And I was like, who is this guy? Why are you yelling at me? And you've got a jet. OK, cool. I, I don't I don't have a jet. Let's <laughs> let's go to this thing we had. Kid four, kid five at the time. Mm -hmm. I looked at Madeline and I said, "Hey, I'm going to Miami." She's like, "What?" <laughs> I think we had twelve hundred bucks, like two thousand bucks left on a credit card, and I like, I buy the ticket. I came down here and saw what was possible mm. from a dollars and cents standpoint because I didn't, I didn't know any better. I'd never been around people with real money. Yeah. So I'm sitting there in Miami Marlins Stadium and Jesse Isler's speaking, and I'm like, "Who are you?" Well, I'm buying this book. And we're signing up for this coaching program. And then saw Pete Vargas speak and still had, I had his, how do you, 
put a speech together framework as my LinkedIn background for two or three years after this event. Mm. So that was really where I found, hey, what am I pouring into me? Mm. And how else can I make other things happen? So when I saw that, when I saw the coaching job for them pop in end of 21, I was like, a volunteer's tribute and let's go make this happen and be around a bunch of high performers. Interesting. You know, that's so funny because you had such a shift from Navy, like, you know, I guess blue collar, right? Yeah. Yeah. Heavy, heavy blue collar. Right. And it's funny because it's kind of like two separate worlds. You know, I, I grew up in Baltimore, so it's very blue collar, yep. you know, city. And then getting into like the I guess I don't even know how to say it because it is like white collar but it's not like corporate America white collar I feel right. like it's a whole different right. sphere now for sure for sure so like did you feel there was like a little spark oh yeah yeah I came back from I came back from growth con in 19 changed jobs in the next two months so shout out to Adam Marr who runs I think it's called Warrior Angels. If I'm brutalizing this, Adam, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he was uh, he was a helicopter pilot for a while, got blown up, is, is doing great, but has a bunch of TBI stuff. So gives back to that whole community mm -hmm. in the, the Warrior Angel space. But we were in we we're in Dallas, Texas, for Thanksgiving with my great grandma, and he was in the Accenture office, and he's like, "Hey, we're hiring vets. Do you want to come see what I do?" And this was just back and forth on LinkedIn. So he walks me around the Accenture office in Dallas. There's nobody there. It's Thanksgiving week. Yeah. Everybody's like, this is what we do. This is X, Y, and Z. Here's our next hiring event. Here's what we can do. You know, would this be something? I was like, yes, Adam, let's do this. So that was my, once again, a random LinkedIn outreach. We we're just going back and forth. But he's like, hey, I'm going to be in the area if you want to come up and see what I do. So he was the one who introduced me to Josh Talbot, who got me the, essentially got me the interview at Accenture. Mm. And then that was my transition from let's go Navy and then manufacturing blue collar world to hey this is corporate America and yeah. Accenture is as, as corporate as it gets <laughs> when, when, it go, it when it comes to culture shock right so yeah. me seeing hey I'm on the floor helping clean these parts measuring X Y and Z making sure this machine's running well helping people to hey here's a Here's our project management framework. <laughs> I'm like, well, this I've seen stuff like this before, but it was that was our our giant project management in the Navy when they changed watch sections, right? Where we were just throwing stuff against the wall for six months, essentially saying, "Hey, what works?" I didn't know what a chart was. I didn't know that there was a bunch of software that, "Hey, here's here's yeah, how you run a project." They make it pretty, right? Right. <laughs> so that was it. Was awesome. I loved. I loved my time there. If I hadn't been poached from a client to get a essentially a fifty percent pay raise, I'd, I'd probably still be there. But that was my my understanding coming to the event in coming to GrowthCon in nineteen mm -hmm. was like it's all possible. And how how big are you dreaming? And I hadn't dreamt. I hadn't had that next thing since baseball ended. Mm. I didn't know what was possible until I, I went to this thing. I was like, oh. This isn't all just motivational and rah rah. This is like, hey, here's some tangible things that you can go do, yeah, to, to better yourself. And instead of hating life and making making ends meet, why don't we go make some money? Hmm. So you went from dreamer in baseball to just grinding. I need to provide for my family. Oh yeah. I kind of don't like this, but I need to provide right. for my family to. Oh, I can have a good life. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was. The, there are plenty of gurus now that. Are, are making money or not making money and hate home life. But the last thing I ever wanted to do was go make millions of dollars and have the marriage fall apart or have home life be terrible. Right. Right. And it's not, once again, it's not easy having an army of kids. It's not, marriage isn't easy, but are you going to stick it out? Or are you going to make it happen? Or are you going to be like, okay, well this, this was hard. Now I'm going to stop. But mm -hmm. for me, it was, if I can provide a chunk of money and be dad, let's go do this. And let's figure out what that designing your own ideal life yeah. Really came from. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's it's, it's interesting because I feel like, especially as millennials, we we kind of grew up with the messaging that you can't have it all. Oh yeah, of course. Go to college, go to school, get good grades, go to college, you'll be fine, and great, awesome. Or 
if you look at it, instead of if you have to go into debt for it, I I am attempting to raise unemployable children because I want them to have a skill set and I want them to be able to take that anywhere and make money wherever they want. If they want to go work for somebody, fine, mm -hmm. by all means do it. But I want you to have a skill set. I want you to be able to shake a hand. I want you to be able to present. I want you to be able to have people skills mm -hmm. in this world where text, 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 or just shoot something off across social is more prevalent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we, we homeschool all of them, but you're going to learn reading, writing, math. We're going to learn a little history, but I want you to be able to look me in the eye and say, hey, Jessica, hey, Nick, nice to meet you. I'm so-and-so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and have a decent conversation. Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, because I feel like our generation, uh, you know, a decent number of my friends, they want to homeschool their kids. Yeah. When we grew up, homeschool. Oh, it was, oh no. It was weird. It was I was the experimental child in the, the homeschool world. And we moved, so we moved down from Illinois yeah. to South Carolina. I got, I was in third, third grade when we moved down. So did fourth, fifth, sixth. Then my parents pulled me out mm -hmm. after sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So I did seventh, eighth, eighth, ninth at home. Cause I had a late, I had an August birthday and like, we want you to play ball and maybe get drafted and make all the rest of this happen. Yeah. But that was late nineties, early two thousands. Nobody. Nobody was, Nobody no. was homeschooled. No. Like you are, no. Very few people were doing it. Yeah. And it was, how are your kids' social skills going to be? You're the weirdo. Oh, hey, you're, are you in some religious cult or whatever else the other thing was? Where <laughs> yes. now, 20 years later, our generation was like, well, here's what I learned in school. I could teach my kids that. Also, here's the other handful of things that I shouldn't have learned in school. So how can I how can I set the next generation up for success and make it happen? But with things that are going on in schools right now. Oh my gosh, it's wild. Pull, pull all your kids out. Pull all your kids out. Yeah. You yeah. can do it. You don't you don't need you don't need a PhD to teach your kids through sixth grade math or history or any of the rest of it. Mm -hmm. If you need help in middle school or high school, there are tons of resources now that didn't exist yeah. twenty years ago. Yeah. Where and then from a community standpoint People are always worried about the, the socializing side of things. The only time you're around people that are your age, only people your age is in school. Mm -hmm. So where where else can you find a community where there's a bunch of other homeschooling people and what do they do? Are your kids interested in any of that? But have there are plenty of communities out there that meet up once a week, twice a month to get together and have the kids actually interact and have a good time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the... The, the stigma of your kids won't be socialized or won't function in societies. Uh, ben, yeah, that's not true. Uh, debunks the wrong word, but it's like there's a bunch <laughs> of data that says otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's really good because you're 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 raising your kids for them to be empowered to craft their own future. Right. Where with us, you know, I, I stayed in the you know schooling route, yeah. but it's like you're you're trained to believe that if you just work hard for someone else's company. Hopefully, right. They'll be able to pay you so you could live an okay life. Yeah, right. Well, and that's the. If you want to look at job hopper statistics, or you want to look at people that stay in places, the the more. Especially here in twenty twenty four, there's no job that's secure mm -mm. if it's not your thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So go go figure out if you need a nine to five. This is not ripping on everybody that has a nine to five. If you need to go work for somebody else, go work for somebody else. And then if there's a way you can build out anything to make money, go do it. Mm -hmm. Go do it. Um, but that was the, hey, go to school, get the good grades, do all the rest of it. I, I didn't go back to school till I was 27. Yeah. When I cared. Mm -hmm. Right? So at 18, if 18-year-old you was sitting down and said, hey, what do you want to do? If you know at 18, good on you. <laughs> you're, you're beating a bunch of us. <laughs> yeah. 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 But and it's funny because even a lot of 18 year olds today, like they're they're going out there and starting a business. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I think that is one of the greater benefits of social media. There is a lot of information out there that they don't teach you in school. Right. right. You know, even for myself journeying on my own, I'm like, OK, I didn't learn any of this. OK. Yeah. You know, let me test this, try this, do this, try this and let me see what works. But right. yeah, it's a continuous learning journey that, you know, I wish I was taught sooner. Correct. Correct. And that's the there are countless pages and accounts dedicated to, hey, here's the 20 things I didn't learn in school. Go learn these. 
right? But you're in a, a YouTube social media generation where YouTubers are making millions of dollars, mm-hmm. right? You've got you've got kids that are in a school system right now that are training for jobs from 2010 that aren't going to exist in 2030, right? So trying to figure out, hey, what is the next thing? If you're if you're not plugged, if you're not at least playing with AI, if you're not playing in the social media space, if you're not figuring out what the next thing is, mm-hmm. you're already behind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're already behind. So trying to train for what does 2030 look like? Get your kids in front of something that's not, hey, I'm going to go major in history. Like, I want you to know a little bit about history. But I also want you to make some money. Yeah, there is a benefit to learning about history. Oh, 100 percent. This is this is not a this is not a don't go learn <laughs> history. This is a, from a major standpoint. And how much are you making? Uh-huh. Um, that that's this. Yeah, that's my. I've I've got a sister that just got her master's in philosophy. So like I understand. Hey, there there is a there is a quality of life, or there is some value there, mm-hmm. right? And I, I I want you to know about history, but I also don't want you to have. Hey, this actually happened X, Y, and Z. I don't. I don't want your head filled with a bunch of dates. Yes. For yes. a test. Yes. That that's useless. I want you to know cycles of history so you yes. can see them. Yes. And then say, yes. here's here's where I need to move moving forward. Yeah, yeah. And and the reason why I, I say that there is benefit in yeah. learning a history, especially when it comes to business, and especially when it comes to raising your kids and the type of information you should feed your kids is, you know, everyone wants to rage about like Rockefeller. Yes. He was a great businessman, everything like that, right. but he wanted workers. hundred percent. And 100%. the shift that we're seeing now, people are pulling them, their kids out of the, the institutional schools yep. and you know, they're providing them with left brain things and right brain things being Correct. a holistic person, right? which is now leading to, more people into starting a business again because before Rockefeller changed everything, there was everybody had a little right. thing going on for sure. We were also in a a, a barter system mm-hmm. or a hey, I'm going to provide X and you provide Y and we're we're going to make it happen. And I don't need, I don't have a, another hand coming in that's taking money out of the pot, mm-hmm. right? So and I love the there's a study out there where they they're measuring five year olds and then they measure ten year olds mm-hmm. from just a genius level standpoint. Mm-hmm. And it was an astronomical number of five year olds are geniuses, and then it was like five or ten percent oh, of the ten year olds, right? So as as they progress through school, your creativity went down. Your hey, I'm sitting here for six hours. All, all of that, like we essentially suck it all out of you. And then hey, congratulations on sitting in front of your teacher for eight hours a day mm-hmm. for your sixteen years. Mm-hmm. Now now go do it in the corporate world where we're going to pay you to do it and do whatever the thing is. Yeah. And it's not natural because now you're seeing this whole phenomena of mental health issues. Of course. Because of people working in these jobs that are not fulfilling to them. Right. right. Well, yeah. And and you've got a bunch of people that are living paycheck to paycheck that are trying to make ends meet. And mm-hmm. like, shout out to you. Keep going. Right. But there is something you use. One of my buddies has been in the affiliate marketing space for 15 years. Right. So before everybody did this last year and a half, there is something you use every day. That has an affiliate program where you can drop a link or you can refer it to somebody. They buy it, you're getting paid a little bit. Mm-hmm. And sure, it's not going to put millions of dollars in your pocket initially, but you need to figure out a different way to make money or invest mm-hmm. versus, hey, I'm going to save my way to wealth. Mm-hmm. You can't even save your way to no. wealth no, any, uh, like nowadays, you know, especially with the crazy amount of inflation. That's what happens when you print trillions <laughs> of dollars. It was 80% of all dollars were have been printed in the last in 2021 is last or 2022 is last two years yikes so through through covid when we're like hey here's checks for everybody or here's x y and z cool yeah but your value of the dollar went from i can buy i can buy this water bottle to i can buy this much water left mm-hmm. inside of it so yeah yeah that's they don't teach you that either Mm-mm. no like, with oh, the economics. Hey, oh hey dollars right yeah yeah and then that the risk of just trying to save your way right Especially with the political things going on. Sure. We're not going to get into the politics. For sure. No, but absolutely. Right. things are shifting. Correct. Well, you're also having the the rise of the individual now where I don't need, with the amount of systems that happen, you're going to have million and billion dollar businesses here in the next five, ten years that are run by four people. Yeah. Three people. Because I don't need a, a whole, I don't need a giant ecosystem of people. I've got some AI or some software or something else. There's the solution. 
go. Yeah. And you're, yeah, you're already seeing that happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, where are you today? I I want to stay in the, the coaching consulting world for the next 10 to 15. I signed two people yesterday to help them get on stages and just put them in front of the right people. And where am I going? We moved all eight kids to uh, a couple different houses, but we are doing the homeless travel thing right now and staying <laughs> in midterm furnished rentals. And there's there's a journey ahead there. Where do I want to be? I want to be in a place surrounded by amazing people. Either either get a either get a great message out or just connect with the right people to the right other people. Mm -hmm. So, um, what does that look like in 25? Somewhere outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm. with a, a compound and four or five other crazy homeschool families. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have a plan? No, no, no. I, he's like he's like he said he said straight up. Ten minutes from now, I have a plan. He said, outside of that, I don't. He's like, I have I have a schedule and I have my bookings. I either had to rephrase a question or he was like, hey, here's what I think you're asking. And then went. But I was like, oh. it's very, well, it's very present. Mm -hmm. It's very present where I'm looking either too far in the future or I'm worried about whatever happened before where you're not right there. But for him, this was a guy who three months ago said, hey, I'm going to go get my real estate license and got it two weeks later, three weeks later. Interesting. That's that's it. <laughs> that's it's that's like, the plan. <laughs> that's so funny because like I'm a project manager by right. nature, right? Or not by nature, actually by by profession. Right. We're in the place we're in right now for for another month, and then we've got a couple different options after that. But we're either going north or we're going out west, and we'll figure it out. Present. This is the most most free I've ever been. I'm finally living life on my own terms. And do I answer to people? Yes. A couple of different contracts out there and a couple of different things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I don't have a, hey, you, you have to be in the office doing X, Y, and Z for eight hours a day. Ever had an account? It's not the most amount of money I've ever made in a, a certain window. Mm -hmm. But that's also not saying, uh, this is not saying money doesn't matter. At some point, we're not to the point where it doesn't with the army, but if I don't work for the next six months, 12 months, we're not hurting and it's, and it's not awful. So get to a point figure out what you can do to where you can make a bunch of money and then e either invest it, put it somewhere, or find a way to multiply it, mm -hmm. then live off of that for forever. But you have to, you have to know for, for me, the three things now are mindset mentors and metrics, right? So who you, what is, what is your head? I, I, we can give you all the training in the world and all the information in the world. And if your head's wrong, yeah, you're done. Who are you learning from? Because there's somebody that's done what you want to do. That's true. Out there somewhere. And I don't need you reaching out to the Tony Robbins of the world or the grants of the world. Like, but there's somebody that's two steps ahead of you, four steps ahead of you that would love to help you with whatever the next thing is. And then what are you measuring? For me, the thing I'm trying to dial in right now is the sleep side of things. Because mm. we get that dialed in, all the rest of it's good. But the health's finally where it's, it needs to be. Finances are good. Home's good. Just need to you know get more than six hours a night. What well, <laughs> I drink I drink a tea. I drink this tea. I love this tea. I've been yeah. drinking it since uh I guess I should get like an affiliate marketing. 100%. 100%. <laughs> plug the plug the tea link at the bottom of this episode. Yeah, it's called Solomon <laughs> Seal. Okay. Like I drink it every single night Perfect. and knock with me and my husband out like Let's like. go. Let's go. Okay, yeah, cool. So, I'll I'll take a look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that tea definitely helps. That's Perfect. that's wonderful. So where can people find you? Yeah, for sure. So my my cell is on my LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm real estate with Nick on TikTok. It's real Nick Mershon on every other social. Instagram or LinkedIn are probably number one. And mm -hmm. then to shoot that shoot a shoot a text to that cell on LinkedIn. And uh I don't know where I'll be right now, but right now I'm in South Florida. So today. Yeah, today. What's today's <laughs> date? March 6th, 7th? <laughs> yeah, so, somewhere in there. But yeah, that, that's how you can reach me. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I'm pumped for your growth, for everything that's ha going to happen here in 2024 that everybody's been working towards. So thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Of course.